Trust you have the notes with you. It's a little bit longer, but because there is some reading, it won't take as long to get through as it might look on the front end of all of that. Well, we're going to be starting in John chapter 10. As I've mentioned, there is a book and actually a series called Jesus Calling, and that's where the title comes from, Another Jesus Calling, because as we'll see, What is presented in these books is not entirely biblical and is, in fact, frankly, disturbing. And though the book was written 18 years ago, there are many, many iterations of the book and more coming out all the time. So it's important for us as God's people to be aware of what there is out there. And when people perhaps mention they're using one of these things, try to steer them to something which would be more helpful, spiritually speaking. Perhaps you've never heard of these books. Well, I guarantee you from this point, you will, Uh, simply because of the repetition factor. You hear it once, it's it's put in your brain, and then you're going to be looking for it. But let's go to John chapter 10, and we're just going to read down through verses 1 through 5. You'll notice I've highlighted some things in uh, red or in blue that kind of differentiate between the true shepherd or the true sheep and the false shepherd or the false sheep. But John chapter 10 says, Truly I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them. His sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. I want us just to observe a couple key points from these verses. Things that should be fairly obvious, for instance, shepherd follow their sheep. Or sheep follow their shepherd, I can't even read. Sheep follow their shepherd. That is a, an observation that's you know, it doesn't require a lot of explanation, but the contrast that's being made here is between the true sheep and the false sheep, the sheep that really know the voice of Jesus Christ. So there is the point made in the first verse that false shepherds are deceitful thieves. They come to steal, to kill. These individuals are interested in making money off the gospel, and off of believers. There's enough truth in what they say to lure the unsuspecting, but it should not succeed in luring the true sheep of Jesus Christ. Because these individuals that we're talking about, these false shepherds, they do not know or follow the true shepherd, and that becomes very obvious by their teaching and many times by their way of life. But the quality of the sheep or the nature of the sheep is revealed by the shepherd that they do follow. Because everyone follows someone. They follow some teaching. And the idea here is that Christ's sheep will follow Christ. Other sheep can follow the false shepherd because they don't have an attachment to Christ. And the illustration is made here of the voice of the shepherd. That the voice of the great shepherd of Jesus Christ is known by his sheep. They perceive the voice of Jesus Christ even amidst the din of false messages that constantly barrage them. Have you ever had that knowledge that something wasn't quite right biblically even though you might not be able to put your finger on it? It's amazing how often that statement has been made to me over the years. I know this isn't quite right. Help me see what the problem is. And that's an evidence that a person does know the shepherd's voice because it's only the voice of the true shepherd that will do for such individuals. And anything that is not consistent with that voice is not interesting to them because true sheep will flee from false shepherds. Unfortunately, false shepherds are being brought into the church more and more frequently. And churches are being decimated because 
People don't have the discernment developed to discern between truth and error. And many churches are filled with people that do not know Jesus Christ. So we're coming to this book called Jesus Calling, and it has come out in many editions since 2004. And we'll talk about some of the changes that have happened. But this entire, this book has produced what can only be called a commercial juggernaut. The book is written by Sarah Young. She is a former Christian missionary, now pastor's wife, mother, and of course writer. Uh, her husband pastors in the Presbyterian Church in America, the more conservative of the mainline Presbyterian denominations. But her book was first published in 2004 and currently is under the label owned by Thomas Nelson. Now, I mentioned that it's not just this one book. In fact, Jesus Calling has spawned Jesus Listens, Jesus Always, Jesus Today, Jesus Lives, Jesus for Children, for Little Ones, Jesus Calling Storybook, and on and on and on and on it goes. In fact, the Jesus Calling series has sold more than 35 million copies. At roughly 10 bucks a book, you do the math. And that's not the entirety of the, the cash stream that they have. Because they also have an app, a magazine, a blog, a podcast, a television series, and other things. Not surprisingly, this series, Jesus Calling, has received rave reviews. I'll just consider a couple of them. Who hasn't heard of Max Lucado, pastor and writer in his own right? And he says, it would be hard to overestimate the impact of the writings of Sarah Young. She is a stream in the desert. Her words quench our thirst. That's troubling that kind of review, because it sounds as if she's writing scripture, in his opinion. These are the kinds of things that that scripture describes itself as. In fact, it was Jesus in John 7, 37, who said, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Kathy Lee Gifford, television personality, said, My friend gave... Jesus calling to me years ago. It has become a part of my daily devotional. I bought every Sarah Young book since. They just keep meeting the needs of my heart. I think only the word of God can really do that. Only the word of God can meet the true needs of our heart. And it's important to note that this kind of accolade is given when her books are not even biblical. Now, they have, a, an, ink, they have a, an idea of, of biblical fidelity, but we'll, we'll soon see that they're not. Another individual, not of great renown, but uh, she is a frequent contributor to Christianity Today, Laura Turner, she was responding to a criticism of Jesus' calling, and she wrote, Theology policing is a job best left to the Holy Spirit and then to the people who we know. She says the book is a net positive and has been a tool through which many people have gotten closer to God. This was in a religious news service article uh, called Jesus Calling and the Policing of Theology. So apparently, according to Turner, calling out error is theology policing, and you're not allowed to do that. You can't criticize something like this. But the very statement that she makes here belies the problem. She says, this series is a net positive. What does that mean? If it's a net positive, it has to have some negatives. But on balance, she's saying, it's a positive. But let me hasten to add, especially in reference to the last part of her quote, this is a tool through which many have gotten closer to God. Error is incapable of bringing people closer to God. But the endorsements keep coming, one after the other, and here's just a small list. You might remember the name Mark Batterson. He's one of the individuals we have quoted throughout the God's Will series. And then you have 
popular writer Lisa Turcuse, I don't know how she says her name, that's how I say it, Lee Strobel, uh, and on, on, on and on and on, and we could actually fill this screen and probably the next one with the endorsements that have come. This is just a couple of them that I chose to include. Now, all of that is just to set the groundwork so that we can begin to see if there is a problem here. And the problem begins with how the book was written or how Sarah Young describes its writing. But it really, the problem goes back beyond that. You have her description of a conversion event in her life. She was visiting in an alpine village in France, and she says this, Suddenly I felt as if a warm mist enveloped me. I became aware of a lovely presence, and my involuntary response was to whisper, Sweet Jesus. This utterance was totally uncharacteristic of me, and I was shocked to hear myself speaking so tenderly to Jesus. As I pondered this brief communication, I realized it was the response of a converted heart. At that moment, I knew I belonged to him. This was far more than the intellectual answers for which I'd been searching. This was a relationship with the creator of the universe. Any problems you note there? Well, the first thing you ought to note very quickly is that Scripture never describes conversion this way. Nothing like it. Her sense of belonging to Jesus doesn't come from the word and from a biblical response to the word, repentance and faith. It comes from this ecstatic experience as she observes creation. And yes, creation is a testimony to the power and the presence of God, but creation is wholly incapable of providing a relationship. To God. And so I have to call into question even the salvation of an individual who describes conversion in those words. But this isn't where such encounters stop. There's a second encounter she describes, which goes like this. It's about a year after the first one. She's in Atlanta. She's on a business trip, and she's feeling particularly down, lonely, so she went for a walk and she says, I glanced at some books at an outdoor stall and was drawn to Beyond Ourselves by Catherine Marshall. That night as I read the book, I no longer felt alone. I knelt beside the bed in that sterile room and felt an overwhelming presence of peace and love come over me. I knew Jesus was with me and that he sympathized with my heartache. This was unquestionably the same sweet Jesus I had met in the Alps. So again, she has another non-biblical source for feeling God's presence. It doesn't come from the usual means of the word, prayer. It's this ecstatic experience. The Bible, though, never tells us to have our heart needs met this way. This is not what God wants us to do. You're really having a problem, go to find a book stall and buy a book. There is a book. It has 66 books in it. And if you don't pay attention to it, don't expect God to speak to you in any other way. But that isn't even the most troubling of all the things what really is the most troubling is the source of the very book, Jesus Calling. In her introduction in the 2004 version, she says, I began reading God Calling, a book that was published in 1935, and she describes it very accurately as a devotional book written by two anonymous listeners. These women practice waiting quietly in God's presence, pencils and paper in hand, recording the message they receive from him. The messages are written in first person with I designating God. Do you find that troubling? I hope you do. The following year, she says, I began to wonder if I too could receive messages during my times of communing with God. I had been writing in my prayer journals for years, but that was one-way communication. I did all the talking. I knew that God 
communicated with me for the Bible, but I yearned for more. Increasingly, I wanted to hear what God had to say to me personally on a given day. I decided to listen to God with pen in hand, writing down whatever I believed he was saying. I felt awkward the first time I tried this, but I received the message. It was short, biblical, and appropriate. It addressed topics that were current in my life, trust, fear, and closeness to God. I responded by writing in my prayer journal. My journaling had changed from monologue to dialogue. So again, let's do a little observation, and we're not even into the phase of the problems of the book. Obviously, we're seeing some of them just in perspective. But what she describes is the way in which she wrote the book, Jesus Calling, is very akin to occult automatic writing. This is where a person supposedly empties their mind of all thoughts and just waits for some spirit being to communicate with them, and then they write it down. Such a listener disclaims originality for the work, saying it was God or a spirit that told them what to write down. And I don't know if you're aware of it, but this kind of book has been published by mainstream publishers all the way back to the 1970s. Books written under the influence of demons is what I'm talking about in this regard. And I could get you names of the books, but just suffice it to say for now, that's what this sounds a lot like. And the use of I, which she does from God calling to Jesus calling, indicating these are God's words, is an unabashed claim to inspiration or it's an outright fraud. You got your choice. Either she is knowingly writing in God's name what she knows God did not say, or she has deluded herself into thinking that he has said these things. She claims that only the Bible is inspired. You notice that in the previous quote. I know that only the Bible is inspired, but then she goes on to say just the opposite of that. And in fact, she says, she describes her journaling now as dialogue. It is the result of God speaking to her and her writing that down. That's exactly what inspiration is supposed to be. So what are the problems? And we're going to put them under many different heads. And you've seen some of the problems, and one, the first of which that just jumps out at you is that Young claims to write for Jesus. Jesus is telling her, I, she says, God speaking, at other times she says, Jesus speaking, and obviously the title of the book, Jesus Calling, is indicating her perspective that this is Jesus writing this book using her hand. It's interesting that this book reads differently than the Bible, it has a different tone, a different style, a different perspective. The phrase, my presence, is on nearly every page of the book. One reviewer said it becomes almost hypnotic. And she says, regarding this presence at one point in her book, your part, this is supposedly um, Jesus speaking. Oh, wait a minute, I, I've, jumped, I've jumped something here. Okay, there it is. Your part is to be attentive to my messages. Again, supposedly Jesus speaking in whatever form they come. In other words, that creation moment in the Alps or the book in Atlanta or whatever. When you set out to find me in a day, you discover that the world is vibrantly alive with my presence. You can find me not only in beauty and bird calls, I don't know if you're aware of that, but also in tragedy and faces filled with grief. You note there that the reference says July 25th because she writes in a kind of 365-day devotional booklet. Uh, that's the style of most of what she writes. And she continues writing to this day. But again, this is supposedly Jesus speaking. This statement about be attentive to my messages in whatever form they come I thought his message was already given in the Bible. And of course, that's what, the, what we believe. We don't believe there's ongoing inspiration. Now, 
just the very way she is presenting this makes it obvious that she is claiming inspiration as well as authority. You're not supposed to question what she writes because it came from Jesus. And if Jesus said it, you obviously can't argue with it. Only I'm going to argue with whether Jesus said it. So in an interview, she claims that she writes in the same listening to God mode that I use with Jesus calling, talking about her subsequent books. I've continued to write with the help of Christ's spirit who guides my thinking while I listen in his presence. I believe the Bible is the only infallible word of God. My writings are based on that absolute standard, and I try to ensure that they are consistent with Scripture. Hmm. Is that what Paul did? Did Paul try to make sure that what he wrote was consistent with Scripture? No, because if it's coming from Jesus through the Holy Spirit, there isn't any reason to verify it. That's one of the issues we have with this statement. But again, notice she claims that only the Bible is truly inspired. And yet, she says, she describes her process of writing as listening to God with the help of Christ's Spirit. So again, why would she need to ensure the accuracy of it? Why would she need to... Make sure it's consistent with Scripture. If Jesus is speaking, he never speaks contrary to Scripture. But you do have that problem if you're putting words in Jesus' mouth. If you, instead of writing what he says, are writing whatever's in your mind. By the very nature of her writing, she is deriding, she is criticizing, she is nullifying the sufficiency of Scripture. We believe that Scripture is sufficient for all of our needs. 2 Peter 1, verse 3. God has given us in the Word everything we need for life and godliness. That being said, let's contrast it with the way Young writes. She says, I knew that God communicated with me through the Bible, but I yearn for more. It's part of that previous quote. Increasingly, I wanted to hear what God had to say to me personally on a given day. You remember Priscilla Schreier's statement, I want fresh revelation with my name on it. I want designer jeans style revelation. This is amazing what she is saying by this, I wanted more. I wanted more than the Bible, more than what the Bible provided for me. So she's longing for a deeper relationship than the Word of God will allow. Again, is there a problem there? When Paul spoke about wanting to develop a closer walk with the Lord, it was through the Word, Philippians 3 verse 10, that I may know Him, the power of His resurrection, and may share in His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death. How did Paul know any of those things? Through the Word, through actual revelation from God. And yet, Sarah Young says that her deepest spiritual intimacy with God comes through this unbiblical practice. She is not under inspiration, though she says she is. We'll see some of the doctrinal issues in a few moments, additional to what we've seen. She talks about this practice of listening to God. And she says, this practice of listening to God has increased my intimacy with him more than any other spiritual discipline. What other spiritual disciplines are there? What spiritual disciplines are there? Because I do not consider this another one. The word, prayer, preaching and teaching of the word. The spirit through all of those means. But this practice of listening to God, oh, write that down. Let me tell you, that's not how I do my messages. God doesn't speak to me and then I write it down. It's obvious because of the typos and different things like that. But the point of the matter is, I would never claim that. And I would always say you ought to be Bereans and make sure that what I am saying from the Word of God is actually so. But here she's saying this practice of listening to God is more important to her than the Bible. 
So I want to share the messages I have, again, received. Not messages that I'm just thinking and putting out there. So the Bible does not, in any way, endorse her method. In fact, if she is receiving this message from God, as she claimed, if it is through the Holy Spirit, it is Jesus speaking to her, her message must be 100% accurate. Because God doesn't make mistakes. God never had to send a version of Scripture that would correct a previous error. That is not to say printers and translators have not made errors. I'm sure you all are familiar with what was called the adulterer's Bible. In the Ten Commandments, the not was left out of thou shalt not commit adultery. Uh, That wasn't God changing his mind. That was a printer making a horrendous error. And we understand that can happen simply because people are human. And as the saying goes, to err is human. But if she is not 100% accurate, then what what must we judge Sarah Young as? A false prophet. Someone who is not speaking for God. In the very beginning of how she writes, she's imitating teachers of error, these individuals whom she quotes or whom she uses as a model, God calling these two listeners as she styled them, as they styled themselves actually in 1935. These are her heroines, spiritually speaking. And I haven't chosen to indicate the error that's, in, that's involved in that book. Uh, I'm just telling you that it is fraught with error. But her unbiblical teaching, or their unbiblical teaching, is paralleled in Jesus' calling. There's some of the same ideas that are brought out, and obviously the same method. This very practice of automatic writing, as we have said, is occult in its origin. And as we'll see going forward, her writings fail in the test of biblical fidelity. That's a lot of strikes against it. Let's explore some of the ways that her message is not consistent with the Bible. For instance, she rarely speaks of sin, repentance, or the work of Christ on the cross. What did Paul say? that he resolved to know only Christ and him crucified when he came preaching. That was his theme. He just hammered that point. He just kept on that point. If it's that important to the Apostle Paul, who definitely wrote under inspiration, isn't it important that a devotional series make a lot of the cross of Christ? Of course it is. But that's absent. Not, Not completely absent, but it's just... Very, just some token references here and there. She describes prayer as two-way communication. I I challenge anyone to find in Scripture where that's the way God describes prayer. Now, God did speak to certain individuals, Daniel for one, while they were praying. But it was something completely different from what we're talking about here. It's not, I think it was God, I hope it was God, I believe God was speaking to me. And she makes a statement that sounds very close to Scripture, but it's missing one key phrase. And this is supposedly Jesus speaking, I am above all as well as in all. In you all. This sounds more pantheistic than it does biblical. But in the remainder of the quotes that I'm going to share in this section and some that are going forward in other sections, you'll note that Jesus somehow has been morphed into a 21st century middle-aged woman in his speech. You'll see what I mean. This next statement. When your joy in me, this is supposedly Jesus speaking, when your joy in me meets my joy in you, there are fireworks of heavenly ecstasy. Doesn't that sound just like a verse of Scripture? Not. Nowhere near. Sounds like drivel. Uh, Used to describe pablum. I guess today it's formula. Uh, Stuff that's supposed to be just as good as the real stuff, but it's not quite. Or here's another one. Sit quietly in my presence, letting my thoughts reprogram your thinking. Now, we do need to have our minds transformed. But how does that happen? 
through the word. Romans 12, 1 and 2. It is the word of God energized by the spirit of God that transforms the mind of the believer. It's not this sitting quietly home in the presence of Christ. It's different. Or how about this one? While you relax in my presence, I am molding your mind and cleansing your heart. Sounds like a spa. I wonder with cucumbers, well, whatever. This is not biblical, not remotely. And then I want us to notice how me-dependent her Jesus is. Her Jesus is dependent on the disciple. He's not completed himself. Notice this statement. When you trustingly whisper my name, my aching ears are soothed. Does that sound like Jesus in the Bible? Not to a true sheep. Or how about this one? When you walk through a day in trusting dependence on me, again, my aching heart is soothed. This is not Jesus speaking. Or this statement. I am aching to hold you in my everlasting arms, to enfold you in my love, and if you don't let me, I'm just going to be crushed. I, I did add that last part. This is not Jesus. This sounds like recycled psychology. Uh, one of her degrees is in philosophy. Uh, maybe that has a part of it. Or this statement, when you seek my face in response to my love call, both of us are blessed. Doesn't that give you a warm fuzzy? <laughs> this is not biblical. This is not remotely scripture. And of course, another key problem that she has is that she is adding to scripture. In fact, every quote that she attributes to Jesus, every time she uses I, and it's not meaning herself, which is basically every time she uses the pronoun, she's adding to scripture. She's saying, this is what Jesus said. There are some problems with that. She describes Abraham, the Old Testament patriarch, as guilty of son worship. Not S-U-N, but S-O-N, worshiping Isaac. Undisciplined emotions and idolatry, all with reference to Isaac. I have heard those points presented from pulpits, but I've never seen them in Scripture. Interestingly enough, as we'll see in a little bit, that gets edited out in a subsequent edition. Hmm. Here's another quote, supposedly from Christ, and they're certainly in addition to Scripture. Let me, Jesus, control your mind. The mind is the most restless, unruly part of mankind. I risk all to, by granting you freedom to think for yourself. It just gives the idea of Jesus being on pins and needles. Is this going to work out? I really am not sure. The whole concept of risk is not reflective of sovereignty, but of the finite existence that we call chance, circumstantial situations. Here's another quote from her Jesus. He says, I am central to your innermost being. My, your mind goes off in tangents from its holy center from time to time. The quickest way to redirect your mind to me is to whisper my name. Berean alert. Find that phrase in Scripture. Whisper my name. In fact, this idea of a holy center sounds more mystical or even Buddhist. New age, definitely. But not a biblical expression. And as I've alluded to, whispering, Je whispering Jesus' name is not the biblical antidote to anything. If that is in a prayerful mode, we can whisper as well as shout and he will hear us. But that's not what's being said. It's just whisper his name. 
Young's Jesus also laughs, tells us to laugh at the future. Here's the quote. The future is a phantom seeking to spook you. Laugh at the future. Supposedly Jesus talking. Is that the way Jesus talks about our approach to the future? No, it's more like be sober, be vigilant, your adversary, the devil, and so forth. Jesus tells us to be watching, to be vigilant, to not be deceived. Matthew chapter 24 is just filled with these types of warnings, and we could go on to other passages of Scripture. As I mentioned earlier, her books have been corrected for a book written because God, Jesus, was speaking to her through the Holy Spirit. This is, this is problematic. You don't find verses being elliptic from the Word of God because God has had a change of heart. He's become more enlightened or whatever. So the intro to Jesus Calling no longer mentions, from 2014 forward, does not mention God Calling because she took enough flack that between Young and the publisher, they decided, you know, we ought to sanitize that, get rid of that, that way that objection can't be raised. Well, from 2004 to 2013, it's still there. They can't retract all of those books. Also in 2004 to 2013 copies of Jesus Calling, the August 23rd message describes Abraham, as I said before, as a sun worshiper and Mount Moriah was his cleansing. He had to sacrifice Isaac as a way of cleansing himself from this idol worship, this sun worship. But that wasn't very popular because people critiqued that and they said, you know, that's really extra biblical. That's not what God says at all. And so now, from 2014 forward, the message on August 23rd replaces this idea of Abraham with the concept of Jacob loving Joseph more than his other sons and all the family strife that produced. That's certainly a change. Again, God doesn't bow to pressure, nor has he made any errors in his word In the original edition, in January 28th reading, it said, I am with you always. These were the last words I spoke before ascending into heaven. Now, if you're looking at Matthew 28, that appears to be the case. There are, however, some other statements in Scripture that give us a fuller idea of other things that Jesus said to his disciples. For instance, Acts chapter 1. The telling them to go to Jerusalem, wait till they're endued with power, so on and so forth. And so from 2014 and forward, January 28th now reads this way. I spoke these words to my disciples after my resurrection. That is the words, I am with you always. Again, she's changing it because she was caught misrepresenting scripture. So let's sum all of this up. Sarah Young may be writing under a delusion, but she's certainly writing under false pretenses. What she says is the source of the book cannot be the source of the book or it would be consistent with Scripture. And it would be appended to what we carry as the Bible. She's not writing for Jesus, nor is she under the Spirit's control. Otherwise, her statements would be more biblically accurate. And defensible. She continually continually talks about her heart needs being met this way and that way, and that our heart needs will be met this way and that way, but we know that our heart needs are really truly only met through the Word of God. Nothing else comes close. Man's uninspired writings, and Jesus' calling would certainly be in that category cannot compare with the word of God. It reminds me of Ecclesiastes 12, verse 12, which says, of making many books, there is no end. But it doesn't say of making many books of the Bible. Books are constantly being published and positioned in a way that can help them sell. As I've mentioned, this has been a commercial juggernaut and continues to exceed all expectations in sales. When the Bible speaks of itself, and only when it speaks of itself, does it use the superlative tones about its own richness. 
I want us to finish with Psalm 19, because when you have a message like this, so many quotes have been thrown out that are unbiblical. I, I don't want us to go away with just that in our minds. But notice how God's Word describes itself, Psalm 19, verses 7 through 11. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, and in keeping them there is great reward." That's how Scripture speaks of itself. And certainly, any other book written by mankind won't even come close. Why do we need something else when Scripture is so complete? And yet, people find themselves running off after things like this, just really showing where they are in relationship to the true shepherd. Listen to any voice but his. Be careful. I'm sure, and I know this is not the only such example that we could find out there in the market. It happens just to be one that has a very large market slice. Let's pray. Father, use your word to fill our minds and hearts. Give us the desire to meditate on your word, to let it seep into every part of our thinking, and of our lives. May we never be satisfied with purely man's word, masquerading as God's word. May our hearts yearn for more of your word, to know it better, to understand it more fully. Father, deliver those who are being deceived. May they see the truth of your word instead of the error that is being foisted upon them. Lord, teach us to be discerning and then to be compassionate as we try to help the undiscerning. To in love, share with them the truth as your word explains it to us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.